Uh, my name is Dean, as you can see in the notes. Um, my master thesis was in Tel Aviv University. I was wa working on disease modeling. Uh, the reason we need disease modeling was uh, better explained by this chart. So basically, 4,000 is the number I want to start with the, the lecture, and 4,000 will be the amount of measles cases we've got in Israel since from about March 2018. 4,000 is, is a lot. Comparing to 2016, we had 11, and 2017, we had 31. So 4,000 would be a lot, and you can see this in this chart. Uh, this is a project of mine. This is a side project that relates to the thesis I've done in, in the university. In the university, I've worked with the Ministry of Health data, and their data is messy. You've, you go into this website, you get weekly reports in this Excel format, two Excel formats, actually, the old one and the new one. Then you download it and you open the Excel file. It's not formatted very well. It's it's more for like it, it would be nice if you print it and then you give it to someone to look for like a minute. And it formatted very, very nicely. They have like the, their logo and everything else. But uh, if you're a data person like us, well, it's not easily formatted. So uh, on this side project, uh, which I welcome you all to enter, Epidemic COIL, um, you can see data about disease in Israel since 2004 and how they progress, uh, not only for measles, for like 30 or 40 diseases. Um, so that would be the shameless plug for my uh, website. And this talk would be about disease modeling with SciPy and PyMC. This is a long talk, the 40 minute one, so I hope you're all ready for that. Uh, what I like to do in the Python conventions, unlike the only AI conventions, would be to actually show some Python We'll make it sort of like a mini tutorial. It's not like a workshop. I'm not expecting you to actually open uh, Jupyter Notebooks later and try it, but uh, it will give you some sense of how this works and give you the uh, confidence that you can actually do it in Python and not just like, well, now what do I do after I've seen this talk? Um, so the first part, we'll talk about dynamic models. Disease models are a specific kind of what's called dynamic model. Later, we talk, we're going to talk about a disease model. Later, we're going to put that aside. We're going to learn something about a method called MCMC. It's a Markov chain Monte Carlo. The fourth part would be feeding a disease model for data. The fifth part would be simulating futures, and we'll see why, why you're going to need that. And the sixth part, because I'm going to show you, in the five parts, I'm going to show you some toy examples, and maybe they won't be as impressive. In the sixth part, I'm going to talk a few minutes about my thesis and how we've taken all the five parts and made those into uh, uh, something that's worth of uh, university work. Uh, we'll start with dynamic model. So a dynamic model basically looks like that. You want to model, you have compartments. Those are called compartments. So we have compartments of kids, of adults, and the mature population. And you start with uh, something with a uh, state zero. Oh, let's see code. So you have you say now that I count those people, I can see that I have 100 kids, 800 adults, and 100 mature people. And I know that the adults uh, reproduce. So in Israel specifically, each family has an average 3.1 kids. So that's divide that by two. That's per person. And uh, let's say we know that um, the kid, after 21 years, they become mature, and after 20, uh, they become an adult, and after 20 years, they become mature. Uh, the kids have the um, uh, nice uh, attribute that they get new people into the club. Those are babies. Uh, the mature people, sadly, have the less uh, desiring attribute would be dying. So let's say uh, that uh, after 41, 3% of the population that is older than 20, the 41 dies each year. Uh, we, we call them timestamps, but let's imagine those are years. You can work in weeks, months, however you choose. So we can start with the first part, and that's saying what's the state zero. So, so we started with 100 kids, and then we moved with uh, 800 adults and uh, 100 mature people. We're going to do this with regular Python now. Um, we start this, uh, we initialize those, uh, we say let's do it for 80 years, so we initialize those uh, 80 zeros, and then we say the kids at point uh, zero would be 100. Then we define all the parameters, 
Uh, so we say this, are, this is the reproducing part, uh, it's 3.1, but then divided by 20 years, uh, and then divided by two, because we have a man and a woman. Um, then you have the 3% dying, and then um, you have the rates of becoming an adult and the rates of becoming a mature person. And then you want to do some kind of a loop. So you start the loop at one and not at zero because you have point zero. And you say, well, I'll, let's call the previous point in a name. Let's K, A, and M or the previous point for kids, adults, and mature. And for kids, for example, you can say, well, how many kids do I have at point one? I have the K, this is the previous point. Then some of them grow up, so it's a minus, and some of them get re uh, born. So uh, what it is, it's dependent on how, how many adults and uh, multiplied by that reproducing rate. And you can do this for the mature population and the adult population, so some of them become mature and some of them um, populate. And uh, what you can see here, that some of them appear twice, twice, right? You have the minus in the A times two mature, but then in the mature people, you have the plus on the A times two mature. So you run this loop, and what you get are three uh, vectors or NumPy arrays that you can plot. So if we start with a 100 and, 100 and 800, you can see in the first part, these are the like total numbers because uh, the birth is stronger than dying. And you can see in the uh, bottom part the, the share of them. So you can see that even though you start with many adults, adults because we reproduce a lot is dying and dying is pretty hard, uh, that actually the adult population become less than the mature population and the kids. So why I'm showing this because uh, I want to show you what's a disease model. So a disease model is basically the same, just instead of calling them kids, mature and adult people, we're going to tell, call them by different names. So we have one population that's a susceptible population. They could get sick by some new disease. We have another population, they are the infected population, they are actually sick currently. And we have another population, they are the recovered population. So that's basically, that's an SIR model, that's the mother of all other models in what's called disease modeling. And what, what we need is a rate. So we start with rates. Uh, the gamma is the recovery rate. So uh, let's say in this point it's uh, 0.2. It means that at each time stamp, 0.2 of the infected population will become recovered. So that means that in about five, if I'm getting sick, in about five timestamps, I'm gonna become recovered. And the beta, well, that will be our little secret. The beta is something that's called force of infection. It's some magical number uh, that we're not sure how to measure, but the thing is we, we have uh, some sense of it if we're comparing different diseases. So let's say a measles, what's now, uh, we have a measles outbreak because you see if you can someone sometimes get a WhatsApp uh, message that says like, if you've been in the cinema city in Rishon Zion yesterday at four o'clock and you've been there until seven, then maybe you, you need to go check yourself because one person that's in a place, it, it, they can be very infectious for like three hours after they left the place. Unlike HIV where you actually need to have sex with a specific one person and that would be a lot harder to get infected by that disease. So the beta for measles would be a lot higher than HIV, for example. Uh, so we're not sure how to measure that, but we're gonna see that later, but we just know that um, some diseases are higher than others. The another thing we need is the state zero. So we can start by uh, saying that, uh, and so we need to start with the state zero. So let's say it's a new disease and only one person out of 10 million gets the disease. The rest of the populations are susceptible and none of them have recovered because none of them were sick. Just now, instead of uh, doing it with loops in Python, we're gonna say this is a differential equation model. So instead of saying, calling them time points, we're going for a continuous time Markov model, if you want the uh, scientific name, and you say, the change in S, that's like the next time point of S, would be dS by dt, uh, would be uh, minus beta times i, so the, the force of the infection, 
times how many people are infected, and those will be taken out of S, so times S. And the amount of people are entering into I are the same or the inverse of that um, in the I. And what else? The I loses some sick people, so that's the gamma, that's the recovery rate. So they're getting out of I, and they're getting into R, and R gets that in a plus. So if you uh, actually add all those things together, you get a zero, and that's basically one property that we really want in that kind of model is that all of them are canceling each other out, and that kind of promises you that uh, if you ignore some overflow errors, that, that should converge into something. Uh, and the code for that would be so kind of the same. We start with this initial uh, state, but then instead of redefining the loops, we let uh, SciPy do the job. So we, what we give SciPy is the timestamp. So we, before it was 80, now it was 70. And we, we give a, we, SciPy asks us for two things. It asks us for the timestamps, that's T, and it asks us for the Y. Y would be the equations, or in our case, would be easier to see, would be the compartments, the S and the I and the R. It wants that as a one variable, so we just pack those as a tuple, and then we unpack them at the beginning, and we get S, I, and R equals Y, so we have the compartment for S, the I, and the R. Now we define the new ones, we define the derivatives, so DS would be minus beta S, I. So it's the same, you can see that it's the same in Python, and the same in uh, the equations, and you can write actually beta in Python. That's that's Python three. It accepts that. Did you know that? Cool. You can actually do Hebrew also. Uh, I don't recommend doing this in a production, but uh, it's, it's nice to have in this talk. So actually, so mi minus beta si, and then you have plus beta si, and then you have minus gamma i, and so forth and so on. And then you just uh, tell SciPy, well, SciPy, please solve it. So you give it, this is the model I need. SciPy wants some other things. So it, it's, it has first the span. So from 0 to TS, TS would be 70. It asks for the state 0. So that's the Y0 we defined, which is a S0, I0, R0. And you can give it also evaluation points. So if, if you don't give it an evaluation point, you just return some uh, points that it decides, but I'm telling it, give me all the points, but in uh, intervals of one over 12. So that kind of, if our model is like year, annual, that would be monthly. And that, that enters into what's called the solution, so sol equals, and what's inside the solution, we can see that sol.t actually gives us the time points. Well, we know the time points, but if, if we didn't say, it, uh, Officially, then it would give us something, then that's the way to check it. And also, it gives us the solution. The sol.y, uh, we can see it's uh, 3 by 70, 780. That's the shape of it because we have one row for each compartment and then 780 timestamps. What we can do now, of course, is plotting that. So, anyone has a guess of how this is going to look? Not all of you at once. Uh, this, this was the part where I got like surprised for the first time starting to actually learning disease models. So you see that we start with like one person sick out of every 10 million, but if the entire population can actually get sick, then they become sick very quickly. So uh, one person is very infectious, they infect some susceptible population. Very quickly, 60% of the population are currently sick. So that's kind of surprising, but then some people got recovered and also they kind of ran out of people to infect. So it starts to get lower until the disease, uh, everybody recovered from the disease and that's basically the SIR model, uh, which kind of gives us the framework to work with for other models. Uh, so basically we can now say that um, a person is recovered. So when you're recovered, you can't get sick, but uh, for some, Disease, you know that you can get sick twice in your lifetime, so probably after some time you get back to a susceptible population. And again, this is, very, this is something that's very specific to the disease. When you get chicken pox, you're probably not going to get chicken pox ever again. So let's, let's say that you get it again in the 200 years. Maybe we'll check that when we get there. Uh, but when you get, I don't know, flu, well, the recovery uh, is about three years, and that, that's for a specific kind. If you get flu each year, that's, that's not uh, negating what I'm saying. But for a specific kind of flu, that would be about three years. 
Uh, so basically, we're doing kind of the same. We're, we have some more parameters to define, but other than that, we're doing this Sears model. We're, ta we're telling um, SciPy to solve it, and it solves it. Anyone has a guess of how this is going to look? Great. Uh, so basically, that's kind of weird because uh, you get some people get sick, then they infect more people, then some of them get recovered, so it goes down, but then some of them got susceptible again, so it goes up, until it reaches some kind of a steady state. And uh, if you look uh, like, like a fractal, you look inside and inside, you all get this shape, but uh, around a very specific area. And uh, if you look specifically at the, uh, the infectious population, it seems like not a lot, because there are less than 1% of the population, but if you take the 9 million people in Israel, well, you get that it's still like 27,000 people that are currently sick, and that's one of the hard things we have in this uh, in this uh, research. That it kind of in the models it kind of seems low, but when you think about like what's uh, one in 2,000, uh, one in uh, 10,000 would be still like a lot of people that are currently sick and still need to research that. Okay, so put that aside, you can have a rest from uh, dynamic models. I hope this was new for some people. And now we'll talk about MCMC. So MCMC is a sampling method, a statistical sampling method. That's Its job would be to fit uh, anything into data. And uh, the main use case would be to fit disease data to disease modeling, but that's kind of hard to do when you're not sure about what MCMC is, so we'll start with simple examples. MCMC is based on what's called Bayesian inference. That's in its turn, you have like this one formula that everybody knows from uh, like high school maybe. And uh, everything is based on that. So let's, let's generate some random noise. And that random noise is noise that's taken after sampling from the equation y equals 3x plus 4, that would be our little secret. We're not going to tell Python that's the formula. What we're going to ask Python is what's, what is the chance that this guess, uh, let's give it a guess. Let's say I think this is actually 2x plus 5. What's the probability, given the data, that, the, uh, that this line uh, of the, what's the probability of b that being y equals 2x plus 5? Well, we're not sure what, what, what's to define here, like what's the probability that a is two and b is five and that y equals ax plus b, given the data, we have no idea. What we may know, uh, we, we can try and base that, right? So this is different. We, what we may know is actually what's the probability of the data giving this model. So this this first part, we, we, can, we can compute that. We need uh, some functions. And uh, some like likelihood computations are not very easy, but we can actually know that. But then you need to multiply this by uh, the uh, what's the probability at all of a being two and b a b being five, and also you need to divide it by the probability of the data. And that's some magical thing. Like what's the probability of a data? And what I'm gonna show you is that it doesn't really matter because we, the the actual number is not important for us. What's important for us is actually comparing. Uh, two different models. Uh, so we don't know that and we don't know that, uh, but uh, if you wanna know uh, the first part, like what's the probability of A is two and B is five, we can start with prior. So I believe that, I'm not sure what A is, but I believe it's uniformly distributed between zero and 10. Why? Because I see it's going up, so it's not less than zero and it's not 10 because it's not that steep. So let's say that A is probably somewhere between zero and 10, and B is probably somewhere between zero and 10. And about the data, well, this is that like mathematical not notion would be that it's the sum of all possibilities over everything integrated. Well, pff, I don't know what that is. But we can compare two. So I'm giving you two propositions. One would be that y is e equals two x plus five, and one e it says that y equals 10 x plus 10. Well. Let's start with just deleting the P of the data, right? So this was the hard part and we're, we don't need that. Awesome. Second part would be what's the uh, probability of A being two being five, A being 10 and B being 10, but 
we remember that that's uniformly distributed, so we also can delete that, but this will be also kind of a secret between us, because we can say that maybe our prior belief was that they uh, are distributed not uniformly, maybe they distribute uh, normally, and then they wouldn't actually cancel each other out, but you need to trust me here that if, you, if you're given enough data, that's okay. You can kind of uh, think about canceling them. Uh, don't catch me on that uh, formally, but it uh, kind of works. So now what we need to uh, compare are what's the chances of the data for, for this model and what's the chances of the data for this model. And uh, well, we can see kind of by the eye that uh, probably the 2x plus 5 is better than the 10x plus 10, even though it's not what we call the maximum likelihood estimation, it's more likely than the other one. So if we're searching in the space, like what do we, what's the better model, uh, we'll say that the left one, and if uh, you want to jump there, so you want to search the space next to the 10 plus 10 and 10, well, if you were doing uh, SGD or some kind of optimization, you would say, no, I wouldn't move there because it's probably the answer is closer to 2x plus 5 than to 10x plus 10. What we have in the MCMC, we say, maybe jump there. If it's a better proposition, explore that space. If it's not, still maybe explore that space, but uh, kind of uh, choose it by the, some chance that's dependent on the relation between those two numbers. Uh, why we, why we, why are you going to need this? Because there's uh, uh, the algorithm it's called Metropolis Hastings says that if we do this enough times, then what we're going to get, the samples that we're going to get are going to look like the real distribution of the parameters. And why are we going to need that? Because, and that's the beauty of the Bayesian inference, is that we're not going to get just a point estimate and some confidence interval with some p-value that like 99% of people do not know what that means. It's kind of a triple negative of something. The uh, Bayesian inference is going to give us actual distributions. Uh, that's how it looks, vi looks visually. You're going to start with that point. So the black would be the truth, and the green one would be uh, what we're exploring. And here we go we're exploring another point. So actually, that's farther away, but it got accepted in the uh, random search. Uh, and then we're going to look, so we're asking accept, and we got it to yes, and then we're starting to explore more and more points uh, until we get this. So after like 10,000 of those, this kind of look like this. So we know that the joint distribution of A and B looks like this. It's a lot easier to understand than a joint distribution that's maybe some kind of confidence interval, something, not sure. So. The nice thing about the MCMC part is it gives us distributions and not point estimates. Maybe it's not the best thing to do in a linear regression, uh, but, but for later models, we're going to see why we need that. Uh, so we're going to do this in uh, MCMC, in a PyMC for Python. So this was the generated noise, and this is the regular linear regression. It gets pretty close. Uh, this is how you define a linear regression, right? You have some error that's distributed normally with some error. Uh, the error is distributed normally over some exact answer. In the Bayesian sense, we'll say, this is what I believe about A, about B, and about the noise. And we'll say that Y is distributed normally on this function and the noise. And this is how you define it. I'm starting talking fast because I have 10 more minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, so we... We're going to define those, and that's actually the nice thing about that. It's that what you see as math, you can actually see here as code. So sigma is half normal with some parameters. A is uniform, B is uniform, and Y hat is a X plus B. And the likelihood would be something normal. That's Y at hat and the sigma. And the thing is, we have observed equals Y, and that means that this is the data. Y was the generated uh, data with noise. Uh, so now we can tell uh, PyMC will try to run that because it needs to sample. It shows you this kind of a report of what, I, what it actually done. And after uh, some time, it plots. Uh, you can see some plots. So you, it says this is how, how A is distributed, and this is what I was looking for in the space. The right part is what I was looking for in the, in the space. Like this is a time series of wh where I was searching. You're going to look at that. And see, if you look at the means of those uh, distributions, you can see that A is about 3, B is about 4, 
and the noise is about two, which actually makes sense uh, given how we generated the data. So this is what I call a great success. Uh, the thing is, and we won't go over that because of time, but the thing is you can get nonlinear for free. So in the same sense we've done this, we can actually define some other example. So the, it's AX plus B plus some cosinus, uh, cosine, uh, and that's, we just define that like with Python and then we say PyMC please run that and it looks for something, it finds parameters and then when you uh, plot the maximum likelihood of the parameters, you, you get this line which seems kind of close to the data. And the nice thing about that, it, it's, it's easy to do outlier removal uh, for that. The thing with uh, the, the other way, the, the previous way we done the linear regression, we said that the error is normal, so the normal distribution is very strict with errors. Like it, it says not, everything is important. Even the one here that's like an outlier, this is also important. Where if you say, well, maybe it's not as important, like you say the error may be a student, uh, T student distribution. Uh, so it means that like the farther away you get, I'm still okay with that. I'm okay with the, the fact that it's being farther away. And then you can sample from that, you can get, uh, answers that are a lot closer. You actually don't see the yellow line over the green line, but you can see that it's kind of close. It's 2.91 plus 4.34. So that's a lot closer than the regular linear regression. So why? Okay, so now we have disease data and we have disease models. Uh, the thing is we can't solve those like linear regressions like automatically. We need something better. So what we can do is we can define some model and then we have, we have data, how many people were sick at the exact same time point. And then we can say, okay, let's run the model, get results, compare those, and see what's happening. And uh, this would be uh, monthly patients last 10 years, and this is what I believe is the model. That's actually the hard part in research, understanding what the model is. But the thing is that Python allows you to do some more complex models. You can do any model you kind of want, uh, and you define those, and you have uh, you can uh, people get a person get can get vaccinated uh, in some chance because some people choose not to. Please choose to do so. Uh, but you can lo you can sometimes lose a vaccine, and also if you get vaccinated, some people that get vaccinated are st can still become sick, but then and then they get recovered. But some of them get actually susceptible again. And you have SA and SB because the SA are kids that are not vaccinated because they're, they can't still because some of the vaccines you can get after your one. And we can get most of those uh, from statistical data or clinical tries or some uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics for some population uh, models. The thing is, what's beta? And the beta thing is what's, what we're missing, but luckily we have the data. So what we can do we have the data and we have the model, so you can run the model. You can look for what's the beta. So let's say my prior would be that it's a normal uh, with a one and a one, I believe I'm missing a parameter there. Uh, and then you can run y hat into some black box. That black box runs a model and then gives me results and then you compare those two exactly like we've done with the linear regression. And the black box would be this, so black box gets a beta, and then you define it in other functions. For this function, it's for the outer scope. So this beta uh, changes every time I change it. And uh, you get a solution. The solution, uh, you take the amount of sick people from that solution, and you compare those two. If I can compare those two, then that's great. I can do MCMC. So I'm doing MCMC, and I'm getting a distribution for, data, for beta, and that's awesome. And you can see that we try to see what's the data against the models. You can see that it's not bad. It's not going to be as good as it was in like linear models, but it's not bad. But why? Why should we do this? Do I not just not fit some line with a cosinus and that may work? Well, the thing is that the beta is actually what we're looking for because when you try to do simulation, because the thing is now it's gonna be okay. We've ran this for 30 years, we had no vaccine, so everybody got sick, and it kind of gave us a notion about what beta is, but now we do have a vaccine, and we wanna see how the population is gonna react, but we wanna take the true values of beta. But again, I don't wanna point estimate, because sometimes uh, small changes in beta can give us very strong changes 
in uh, how the population reacts. So we're going to try and sample from beta. And for each of those beta, we're going to see. So the, the nice part would be that because it's Python and not trying to solve ODEs, uh, we can say that p is a 0 until t is 30. When t is larger than 30, well, times 52 because I'm working with Wix, uh, p becomes new p. And the new p is defined in the function. Uh, and then we can try and simulate that. And the red line would be what happens if half of the population gets vaccinated. And the green one would be what's going to happen if all the population is being vaccinated. You would hope for a more, uh, for a stronger drop. The thing is, when we start to vaccinate in this model, we're only starting to vaccinate like babies. We don't vaccinate everybody. Watch what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen in reality. And in the, like smart models, we actually account for that. So that was not a very impressive example. I'm going to show you a bit about uh, my thesis, which, which was optimizing vaccination schedule of pertussis in Israel. So this was the model. You did not see everything because we had the basic model that you're going to see in a second. But then you, we've multiplied that by 20 something because we had a lot of age groups. So now you have 200 something compartments. That's the base model. You have a susceptible population. Then you have two vaccine groups because the vaccine changed in, in some year. Uh, and then because of the vaccine, you, you have two groups of uh, being infected. One of them is more likely to infect other people, but maybe they feel better. And, and then they become recovered. And we have some more interactions in between. And we actually add the death, the birth, and even Aliyah. Uh, we're taking the historical policies. And the beta is not just a scalar now. Actually, beta is a beta J because each part of the population, like kids, are more infectious than maybe mature people. Uh, but And also, the disease is seasonal for because of some reasons we would not model in that way, maybe because of how the virus reacts, maybe actually the how the temperature outside and stuff like that. And the beta would, be, would get into a lambda IJ would be and that would be actually the smart part about those models is that not everybody infects everybody. It's, it, depend, it also depends on who you meet. So in this matrix, you can see here this heat map. You can see, like, depending on my age, what's the uh, chance of me meeting person of a different age? So you can see that in the uh, like main diagonal, you can see that we are mostly meeting people at our own age, but then you can see kind of two secondary diagonals. Those are probably parents and kids. And you can see that uh, people that are over 65 meet each other, not related to age. You can do whatever assumptions you want. And that's how the Emily looks uh, in like real models. It looks more complex. And uh, you can see those by age groups. And uh, it would never look as good as like linear models. But the thing is what the thing that's underlying. And why is that important? Because we've, we're testing some policies and we're trying to compare them. So if we're testing different futures by different policies, uh, we're expecting different results, then we're going to sum up how many sick people we had in those specific times, and then we can compare two policies. So in this specific case, we've tested uh, in pertussis, you get four uh, vaccines when you get to one year of age, and then you get another one at seven and another one at 13, and we wanted to see maybe we have better solutions for that. So the red ones will be what's going to happen if we take one vaccine off. The blue ones are going to take, uh, let's stay with two vaccines, but at different ages. And the yellow one would be uh, what's going to happen if we have three vaccines from 5 to 18. And we can see here, and that's why we needed the, like, actually simulated many futures, and why we needed the distributions of those betas would be to see how, the, how it reacts over, like, a distribution. So you can see that if you want to add a, a vaccine at 18, well, that is no better than just changing the vaccine from age 7 to age 5. Uh, and that would be a lot cheaper because it's one vaccine less and one vaccine needs to get into like a million of people. That becomes a lot of money. Um, I had a spoiler for that in the previous lecture, but uh, this is how the guy looks like. Uh, and th this is very important because a model is defined by like uh, infinite number of parameters. We try to do it in like 200. That's hard, uh, but sometimes it's helpful. That's me. Uh, 
If you want to contact me, mostly through Facebook. I'm the greatest uh, source for the combination of data and dead jokes. So uh, feel free to join. You have this is my blog, and this is Epidemic CIL. This is uh, my proudest uh, moment of the year making Epidemic CIL. And that's it. Thank you.